biological, psychological, and social factors all impact health. Take a moment and think, which model do you think we use? If you want to guess psychological, well, great guess, this is a psychology class, but no, that is not the answer. You're thinking perhaps biological, also a reasonable guess, but no. Then you think it must be social factors. Well, again, no. It is the biopsychosocial model of health. Maybe a trick question, but really not. Additionally, you can arrange those words in any order, but biopsychosocial seems to flow off the tongue just a little bit easier. A related question, well, is there a psychological approach devoted to enhancing health? Go to the video clip attachment and listen, and your answer will be there. I assume from the previous slide, you would concluded that stress will be our next topic. Indeed, you're correct. Let's start with the basics, stressors versus stress. And as you can see, we'll start with stressors. These are threats to our peaceful existence. Really anything that can threaten to rock your boat. Stressors include both daily hassles, which are everyday irritations, and major life events. And maybe you're surprised to learn that even very good major life events are significant stressors. If this was a live class, I'd ask every student to share a daily hassle they've had today, or at least in the last week. It's not hard to think of many. So perhaps take a moment and think of what daily hassles you've had already today. Daily hassles might be everything from not being able to find your keys, to finding a stain on your shirt, to finding that your milk is spoiled, to just hitting every red light as you go to school, and many more. Now, as I mentioned, major life events could be good or bad and still be stressful. Let's take a moment and think of positive life events that are major life events that are indeed highly stressful. Take a moment and see as, as many as you can come up with. The list is endless. Going to college, graduating from college, getting your first job, getting married, having a baby, getting promoted, retiring, and so many more. So we consider stressors, the threats to our peaceful existence. Now let's consider stress. Stress refers to our psychological and physiological reactions to those threatening events. The physiological effects include our fight or flight system, which includes the major stress gland and two of its major hormones. Stress also can affect the brain's glands, which control this gland. And also in the previous chapter, that is chapter three, we learn the branch of the nervous system that's involved in the stress. Since we're getting very, very close to the test, and I assume that you've been studying regularly, hopefully you'll be able to fill in all these blanks. Take a moment and see what you can do. So we learned in chapter three that the adrenal gland is the major gland related to the stress response. And its hormones include adrenaline and cortisol. What glands in the brain involve controlling the adrenal gland and all the other glands? Well, we know that the hypothalamus controls the pituitary, and the pituitary controls all the other glands. So, hypothalamus and pituitary. And which is the stress branch of the nervous system? Remember, we had a mnemonic. We said it would only work though if you're a nice person. If you're a nice person, you see somebody all stressed out or having an emergency, you should feel great sympathy. So that would be our mnemonic. So it would be the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. Most people believe we live in highly stressful times. I'm rather dubious. Let's consider people of the past that live locally. We're very close to the stockade. So let's consider how people lived in the stockade and their stressors, and are our lives really that much more stressful? Let's consider the temperature of your home in the winter, 60 to 75, I assume. Well, people who live in the stockade, during the day, their house would get to a balmy, if they were lucky in winter, mid 40s. At night, it would go below freezing. The water they had, of course, would freeze solid. Are you cold 24 seven in the winter? 
people back then were cold all the time. Do you have running water in your home? Of course. Hot water? Of course. Back in colonial times, you might have to go to the well and break the ice. You might have to go down to the river. So running water in a home would be an unimaginable luxury to these people. Do you have clean clothes? They would not. Are you always hungry? Well, if you are, please visit our food pantry. You can go there up to three times a month. Please remember to bring your bags. And we'll also give you resources for other local food pantries too. What time do you go to bed? 9.45, 10, 11, 11.30? Well, colonial times, people would go to bed at dusk because there was no light in the homes. They could not afford oil. They could not afford candles. Candles were made from tallow, fat. And if you're on the verge of the starvation, you can't take the fat, which could have been calories, and use it in terms of a candle. So people went to bed at dusk. They moved the furniture to the center of the room. And you put your gun or your rifle into place, easy to access place. If you had a second floor, you knew how many steps were up and down in the stairway because you could not see. Right now, as I narrate this, we're in the middle of the COVID epidemic. Hopefully, you don't know anybody that died from it. And if you did, I'm very sorry, and I do extend my sympathy to you. In colonial times, you would know somebody that died every spring. It might be two houses down, ten houses down, maybe in your house, but even young people were regularly dying, which is a rarity in our current times. So are our modern lives truly that stressful compared to people of the past? I do not think so. Let's now consider some of our stress-related responses, starting with problem-focused coping. This would be coping with direct steps to confront the stressor. One gender is more likely to use it. Do you think men or women? Of course, everybody uses it, but men use it more often. It's their go-to strategy. Now, a different response, which we all use, is called the tend and befriend response. This is a tendency more often seen in, you think, men or women. Indeed, women to react to, to, react to stressors by focusing on social ties, stopping at somebody's house, texting, phone calling, uh, asking for a hug. Now let's go to our next related slide. Let's think of two examples. A man and a woman are chatting. In one example, the man has an issue, and the other example, a woman has an issue. What problems can we predict based on the previous slide? Take a moment and see if you can identify again based on the previous slide. So the man is much more likely when discussing his problem with a woman to expect problem-focused coping. And yet she, if she's being typical, will focus more on his feelings and his support needs. So this might be frustrating for him. Now flip it the other way. If the woman's talking, she's not expecting him to fix the problem. She wants support. She wants friendship. She wants non-fixing the problem. But he is very likely to try to fix it for her. And of course, men and women, their behaviors overlap tremendously. But in general, men are more likely to problem focus, and women are more likely to use tend and befriend. So how can we avoid this issue no matter what the person's sex or gender? Simple. Ask the person, what can I do to help you? What can I do to support you? And ask them. Let's continue to explore our stress-related responses. Another one is emotion-focused coping. This is coping by minimizing emotions. Avoiding emotions, minimizing. Another strategy is downward comparisons. This one's fun to talk about. This coping is by comparing yourself to somebody worse off. Isn't there always somebody worse off? Let's say that you uh, took your first exam in a class, and it's not all you hope to be. How could you use downward comparisons? Well, maybe you said, well, at least I didn't fail it. Oh, perhaps you did. Well, at least... You didn't get the lowest grade in the class. Oh, well, maybe you did. Well, at least you took it. Well, maybe you didn't, and so on. So there's always somebody worse off. So you temporarily feel better by comparing yourself to that person. 
not a very effective strategy, but don't people do it? Indeed they do. So let's review for a moment. Please identify the coping strategy used by the woman on the left and the gentleman on the right. Well, if you're for the woman on the left going for the alcohol base, I don't remember lecturing about that one, so that would be a bad answer. You've got to choose from the choices uh, offered. Apparently it's emotion focused. Apparently she's trying to numb her emotions with apparently a white wine. The gentleman, it looks like he's focusing on a manual, so he is definitely engaged in problem focused. Is it the life events that determine our happiness or is it our perception of them? Definitely our perception. For example, two students might each get a C on the test. One might be overjoyed that they passed. Another one might be inconsolable because they usually get the highest grade and for them a C is totally unacceptable. Same event, very different perceptions. Well, consider in this example, a paraplegic has additional burdens in life but their level of happiness is not different than ours. Again, it's the perception of the event, not the event itself that is critical. Many times we can't change our life events, but how we perceive them, well, that is somewhat easier to change. So you're just saying that the perception of the event rather than the event itself is key. So maybe let's put that into motion. I'll give you an example I use of myself. Last semester, I was teaching at Center City for the first time, and to be honest, I wasn't thrilled with dealing with the parking, the extra changing of parking places, uh, learning new facility. And so I kept telling myself, change is good. I am looking forward to change. And I said it with a really, change is good. I am looking forward to change. But as I kept saying to myself, I could feel my attitude changing. In the end, I enjoyed teaching down there, and I enjoyed my students, and I enjoyed the class. So again, it's our perception of events. So please pick something in your life right now that you're not thrilled with. And say the mantra to yourself. I am looking forward to change. Change is good. Actually do it. So And pause this if you need to. So whatever this is, I'm looking forward to change. Change is good. Do this several times a day. Remember to do it and you might actually feel your attitude changing. It's a simple way to feel better about life. Now let's consider the two early great figures in stress studies. The pioneer of stress studies, the guy who got the ball rolling, so to speak, would be Walter Cannon. He coined the fight or flight response. Before you go to the next slide, take a moment and see if you can list many of these factors. It should not be difficult since we've already done chapter three. So we noted changes in BP and blood pressure. We noted increased respiration, uh, perspiration, pupils dilating, uh, more sugar being released into the blood, more adrenaline being released into the blood. Digestion will be slowed. You can't afford to use calories in digestion when you're fighting for your life. So these and many other responses are the fight or flight response. Although Walter Cannon pioneered stress studies, the father of stress studies is another individual, Hans Seal. He coined the GAS, General Adaption Syndrome. Its stages, as you can see, are alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. We'll see what these actually are on the next slide. So stage one, alarm, full out fight or flight response. Stage two, it's being attenuating, it's being weakened. So for example, less hormones. Hopefully the stressor is stopping. If it doesn't, the person goes on or the animal goes on to exhaustion. Exhaustion is physically damaging and actually can be lethal. So the three stages of the GAS, alarm, resistance, and hopefully not getting that far, exhaustion. Let's continue our discussion of the stress response. Research on the HPA axis, in other words, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis has been ongoing and we're learning more and more about its importance. We now know that exposure to either a very extreme stressor or a chronic stressor or stressors can alter the brain permanently 
and affect how we react to stressors later in life. So the effects can be permanent. This area is currently generating considerable research in the focus of children, and in children it's referred to ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences. So again, adverse childhood experiences. So we noted in the previous slide that significant stress alters the HPA axis. Take a moment, I hope you know those three uh, letters. Hypothalamic, or if you prefer hypothalamus is okay, pituitary, adrenal axis. And here's a picture of ACEs. On the picture on the left is a uh, facility in Texas in which uh, legal and illegal immigrants, and I will stress legal also, were being housed. Imagine the stressful nature of that event to all the individuals, but especially children. And on the right, a child's drawing. So children often draw houses and dogs and all sorts of fun things. This is that child's experience. Again, uh, definitely a visual of ACEs. Let's continue and see how stress affects the body. What family of disorders are caused or made greatly worse by stress? The current term would be psychophysiological disorder. If you look at the major categories, heart, gut, breathing, muscles, skin, stress affects different people differently. Which one of those are the areas that you are affected the most in? So stressors are part of life, but what are the behaviors we can do to enhance our health and to minimize the effect of stressors? So consider each picture and then please consider if you're doing a good or not so good area in that particular health behavior at this point in your life. So left showing exercise. So do you exercise daily, weekly? Not at all. Do you do either relaxation such as meditation or yoga? or mindfulness. Next, uh, unhealthy versus healthy eating. Next, getting adequate sleep. In the next slide, we'll consider our social ties, how we interact with others. So consider each one of these and choose one. If you assume that you find uh, any areas that are weak, choose one that you might be willing to work on. So example, food, would you be willing to add one healthy thing to your diet every day, a piece of fruit if you're not eating, or a vegetable once a day? Uh, or choose one, you don't wanna overwhelm yourself, but choose one area. There are many things on the internet for guided mindfulness, uh, maybe walking. So choose one area and integrate that into your life and maybe expand on that or add the next one. And a reminder, remember we were talking about uh, self-statements in terms of welcoming change. Have you been doing it? Remember, I am looking for change, forward to change. Change is good. So don't forget to do that. It will really be helpful. But let's go on to the next slide. Don't forget that people are highly social. We are a social creature. So in times of stress, reach out to friends and family. Is face-to-face -face communication as effective as texting? No, not by a long shot. People with high levels of texting are actually more anxious and more depressed than people with lower levels. So texting is not remotely the same as calling people up on the phone or having a coffee with them or watching a, a movie at their house. So here's a little review for you. Don't say you're learning to the moment for a test. Learn regularly as you go along. So you should at this point be able to do this material. If not, take a few minutes and study so you can. And no, I'm not going to fill the blanks for you this time. Let's consider type A and type B personality. Type A personality was coined by two cardiologists by the name of Friedman 
and Rosenman. The discovery came because they listened to an observation made in their lounge. Their furniture was worn and they were using the repulsor that all the professionals use in the building. And he made an offhand comment saying his, their office had a different wear pattern than the rest of the building. In their office, the only thing that was worn was the edge of the seat, not the back of the seats, not the armrests, as if the people in their office sat on the edge of the seat the entire time. But there were many professional medical offices in that building, but that wear pattern was specific to their office. It got the two cardiologists to thinking about the personality style of heart patients, and they devised, after research, type A personality. People with heart issues, especially early onset heart issues in life, are more likely to be type A. They're time pressured people, highly work oriented. They live to work. They're often perfectionists. Type B, on the other hand, are people people, easygoing, laid back. They work, yes, but they work to live. They don't live to work. You might know where you stand on this dimension, but let's quantify it. And if you don't, all the better. Please go to this link and see if you're a type A or type B personality, or is it possible to be a mixture? We'll have to see. So are you a type A personality, a type B personality, or are you a type A slash B? Next, let's consider extroversion and introversion. The person, though, would be an extrovert or an introvert. Think about each of those terms and then see if you can identify major traits associated with each style. So let's start with people high in extroversion, in other words, the extroverts. They are energized by other people. They get their energy from being around others. They are sociable, more flexible, spontaneous. So if you want to do something at the last moment, an extrovert friend would be more likely to say yes. They're also high energy people. Maybe this describes you well, or perhaps not at all. Let's consider the introverts. You'll notice that shyness is not in this list. Shyness is not an essential feature. What defines them is that whereas the extrovert is energized by other people, the introvert is tired out by other people. They require much more private time. They're cautious in their nature. They let people in, but they're much slower to let others in. And they tend to self-evaluate a lot, asking themselves, why did I do that? Often for years. So go to the website listed and determine if you are more of an introvert or extrovert, or perhaps you're a blend of each. Let's now consider a locus of control. There are two types, internal and external. People with an internal locus believe that they are largely in control of their life's outcomes. Their life is what they make out of it. Other people have a different mindset. They are external locus. They believe that factors outside their control have the biggest say in life. What would be some of these factors? Take a moment and come up with ones that people with an external locus would likely feel are that are in charge. So did you say parents, employer, God, your particular uh, religious institution, teachers perhaps, and so on. So whether you have an external or internal locus can have a profound effect in your life. Do you try to take control of situations? Do you think that your behaviors matter? How easily do you give up on things? Very much influenced by your locus of control. Go to this website, if you will, please and determine your locus of control. Let's say these three students took their first test in whatever class, math, economics, psychology, and unfortunately they all failed it. Determine which locus of control each student has. Then let's consider the implications of their locus. So Jody blames her grades on her teacher Internal or external? Definitely an external locus. I would not be hopeful for Jody passing the course because if she sees her teacher as being the fault, she's not going to alter her studying and approach the class and probably will get the same result on the next test. Sal is blaming his grade on 
his poor tenants and study habits. Sal apparently has an internal locus. I'm hopeful for Sal if he realizes his tenants and study habits are the cause. Maybe he will alter his attendance, missing normal classes, and maybe he'll go to the learning center and then give all sorts of private workshops on study skills. Now let's consider Raphael. He blamed his grade on his usual bad luck. Clearly an external locus, and I'm not hopeful for Raphael either. Uh, he will not attempt to change his behavior if he thinks everything is being controlled by his luck. So let's consider implications. Students with the either internal or external locus are less likely to do homework and more likely to skip class. Would it be internal or external? It would be external because they do not think their behaviors have much an effect on their chance of success. Your success at college is largely, largely, largely in your own hands. What are some of these behaviors? Well, attending every class humanly possible, promptly, knowing your syllabus, keeping track of the dates that our assignments are due, knowing the nature of the assignments. When you're confused, reaching out to the teacher, to tutoring, and to the many, many services at the college, studying regularly and sufficiently, not being the student that waits to the weekend of the test or the night before the test. So with proper behaviors, you will succeed in college and we want to help you succeed. So we are there for you. So please do all you can do and also reach out to the people who are there to help you.